everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker in the series of uh, talks at Google. Um, so several months ago, I had the opportunity to go on a volunteer trip to Uganda with eight ladies, uh, most of whom I hadn't met before. Um, but one of those ladies stood out um, because of her professional background and her uh, the fact that she was an athlete, but also because she was uh, just brought a lot of energy to the group. And the big hair. <laughs> Um, brought a lot of energy, brought a lot of excitement, and also was kind of really um, uh, very passionate about working with the children uh, in Uganda. So uh, that person is Graham um, Padrick. She's most known for her athletic feats. She's the first female Saudi to climb uh, Mount Everest, and she's also the youngest Arab to climb the Seven Summits. And we're super thrilled to have her here today to give her story. Uh, it's very inspirational, and I hope you enjoy it. Before she starts, we'll just watch a quick video of her latest. Walk. Thank you all for coming, by the way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's Thursday. Mm -hmm. Why do I climb mountains? Because I was told I couldn't. No one believed I could do it. But I'm not the type that gives up easily. Being the first Saudi woman and youngest Arab to climb Everest was so far from what people expect. I completely shattered that stereotype. The memory and the feeling of that accomplishment lives on beyond the mountain. I felt like I belonged. Give her an even uh, bigger round of applause because she actually just completed that. Lesson. I finished the seven. Oh. <laughs> so it's the first time I see it actually. Um, I get a little bit emotional when I watch that because it's the first time I see it since I actually finished the seven summits, which is less than a week, um, three weeks ago. I still have really ugly toes. Don't tell my mom, but yeah, I, I can't believe it. But I finally finished the seven, and um, I I always struggle with starting my story because when you hear Saudi woman. Yeah, it's not what you expect. I mean, I know. It's a bit shocking. So I'm going to start from the beginning. And I would love to give you a cool reason why I started climbing, because I was trying to find myself or whatever, you know, would make me sound like a badass. But the truth is, it started with the word no. Just no. Such a small, two-letter word that has the power to enrage the spirit and fuel the soul. It's a two-edged sword that can either hurt you or heal you. The best thing anyone has ever told me once was a very quiet no. It was almost a whisper. I, I, I'm going to start from the beginning. I was born in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, to a father who always taught me to reach for the stars. And to a mother whose spirit I inherited. According to my father, you and your mom copy paste. Same. Exactly. So we have the same kind of spot. He calls it a headache. I, we call it character. So from, from as long, uh, as teeny weeny as I could remember, I was different. I knew I was different. They knew I was, I was an awkward little child. I didn't do the typical things most little girls from Saudi did. And although I was, I felt a bit of a, an oddball, my, my family never asked me to change. My family never made me question who I was. But I did feel like I was different. So for the longest time, I tried to stay inside this little box of what a Saudi girl should be, the typical Saudi girl. I really, really tried to, co to copy my girlfriends that I grew up with, but I couldn't fit in that box no matter how much I tried to conform to the norms. And uh, as I grew, uh, remember being a little girl is not the same as being a woman in Saudi. So as I grew, so did the walls my gender imposed on me. Because when I was a little girl who liked sports and was boy, she was kind of cute, but when I was a woman, and I was being more boyish, and I wanted to play with my brother's friends rather than my sister and dolls, it started to become uncomfortable. And I, I, I couldn't fit. And I said, I, I will never try to be anything other than who I really was, even back then. So uh, I was at the crossroads in my life. I, I knew I had two choices. Option one is go behind this thing that, that drove me since I was a child. I knew I was destined for more than just what, what they expected. Or option two, which is more the t traditional lifestyle of going from wedding to wedding, waiting for Prince Charming to come and sweep me off my feet. You know? <laughs> Ladies, I mean no insult. This is, a lot of people dream of this, especially in my culture. It's like the ultimate uh, goal. 
But it was never meant to be the path I walked. As fate might have it, I wasn't actually meant to walk a path. I was meant to climb one. So I finally reached this conclusion and I said, I'm going to find this thing. I'm going to find the answer to this thing. I didn't even know what the question was. So I was searching. I was, I was so confused, but I never gave up because I knew that there was something out there for me. But that's a lesson I taught myself. That even if you're sometimes lost, even if you're sometimes confused, don't settle for normal. Don't settle for just being comfortable. Live it. I almost gave up. I thought, maybe they're right. Maybe I should go back to Saudi Arabia and wait for the Aris to come and, you know. But I, randomly one day, I kept, I kept my heart and my mind open. Randomly one day, we were sitting with a group of people. And this, this woman I didn't even know said, uh, I'm climbing Kilimanjaro over the Aris holiday. And as soon as she said that, I looked at her and I said, you're doing what? She said, oh, I'm climbing a mountain. It's the highest peak in Africa. And this little fire in my heart, this little thing, just ignited. And I said, you're, you're climbing a mountain. She's like, yeah, it's this. And she started to talk about it. And the more she talked about it, the more I was like, it's sporty, it's outdoorsy, it's dangerous, it's as far away from Saudi as possible. I found it. I, I, this is exactly what I'm going to do to piss my family off <laughs> and to also change my point of view of myself, right? I was still nervous about booking everything. So I started telling people, you know, I'm going to climb uh, Kilimanjaro in Africa. And everybody was like, you're Saudi. And you're a woman, like what everybody was just giving me this really annoying answer, like, what? No, no, you can't do this. And that was the final push. I was hesitant, I wasn't sure. But when people started telling me I couldn't climb a mountain because of the color of my passport, I was insulted. I looked at myself and I found nothing lacking in my capability. I have two legs, I have a brain. Why am I less than anyone else? And that was the, it cemented my idea. Of course, it's not enough to have an idea. I'm, I'm a Saudi woman, after all. So I still had to, to you know, to have the, the, the courage to actually confront my family with it. It wasn't enough to just say, I'm going to climb a mountain. I still had to, to confront my, my poor father. So for, for the second time, I almost gave up. And I said, oh, maybe this is too much. Maybe they're not going to like the idea. But still, that little thing in my heart pulled me. And I said, you know what? My love of adventure far exceeded my fear of rejection. I said, I'm going to call him. Thank God I was in Dubai. He was in Saudi at the time, so it wasn't a face-to-face. -face. So I called him. As soon as I said, hi, daddy. Him knowing me so well, he was like, what did you do? What did you bake? What's wrong? Do you want money? What's up? <laughs> and I said, nothing. I just, you know, since I have some time off now, I've decided to climb the high speak in Africa. As you can see, I speak really fast. And I, was, I, I just went, it's this high and it, it takes this long and I, I was like a broken Wikipedia page and the, the man didn't have a chance to say a word but in reality I was too scared to hear his answer so I just went lin, 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 lin. when I stopped he said no he just said no and it was so loud I'm telling you it was a whisper it was so loud in my mind he just said no not wanting to insult him I was so upset, I hung up because I was really, really aggravated by his answer. I hung up and I went home and could not sleep. I couldn't let it go. That small tribute word grew in my mind till it was till it had claws and it was fanning at my soul. I'm like, how did he say no to me? So I decided to write this long email, and I'm severely dyslexic, so I was writing like this. And the sun came up by the time I was done writing my, my phone book. It was a long, long email. And I threw every single thing he taught me straight at him. You're the one that taught me that I'm limitless. You're the one that taught me that I can reach for the stars. You, 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 you're the one that made me believe I could do this. How are you giving me a ceiling now? How are you giving me a leash now? How could you do this to me? And I tried to be as politically correct as possible because, again, Saudi, you know, dad, you can't really just say, I'll do what I want. And I checked, I, I, I spell checked and checked, and I had my finger on the set, sent button. Now, I've been on 14 expeditions, 7 continents, including a mountain that tried to kill me twice, and that was the top 4 scariest moment of my life. And I took a deep breath and I said it. Now, I'd love to tell you that I went to sleep and everything was fine, but the reality was I ran around myself like a headless chicken thinking, oh my god, what did I do? My dad's going to send my brother to put me in a box with a bow, and my mom's going to go, la, 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 Anyone, anyone take her, anyone marry her. I was, I was thinking, fellas. But I was thinking, I could hear the little, little, I was like, okay, I shot myself in the foot. And to add to the drama, 
My dad, who speaks to me almost every day, I know it's embarrassing, but he does, he calls me every day, ignored me. We always dispute how long it was. I say it was like three weeks, he says it was three days, but you know, depends on who you ask. And he, he ignored me, and throughout this, I call, it, I call them the silent days. Throughout the silent days, I was afraid, I was emotional, my tummy was hurting me, I couldn't sleep. I was every single emotion you could think of. I was a walking, talking Pandora box. But the only feeling I did, I did not feel is regret. Not once did I regret something that came up. And that's when I knew. I was terrified, but it meant the world to me. I knew how much this meant to me. I would also call my mom, and, and my mom's at the inside now. She's like, I don't know what you told him, but he's not talking to anybody. At the end of the three days, three weeks, whatever it is, he replied one sentence. He said, you're crazy, I love you, go for it. That one line, I said, no, he sent me that one line, and neither him nor I nor the world would imagine where I'd end up after sending that line. Of course, I called him and he said, I need a verbal confirmation. Uh, and I got the approval from my family. A few, weeks, a few weeks later, maybe a month later, I find myself standing on Africa's roof. I was hypothermic. I had snow blindness, nearly so snow blindness. I couldn't feel half of my limbs but I was so alive. I don't understand how going to a place that I've never been felt like going home. It felt so familiar to me. It felt so, so real, so, so my own, that I was addicted. I knew that would not be the last time I stand on, on, on the summit. I knew that would not be the last time I tasted what it feels like, the summit. And as soon as I came back down, uh, my parents, I, I walked into the house, Wind burned and everything. I looked like a six month old boot, and I was so happy. And they looked at each other and they said, Oh, no. they knew that there was a problem, and they were right. I could not stop climbing. I kept climbing one mountain after the other, I kept hiking, I kept doing anything you can imagine that I could climb. I kept trying to do until I thought I reached my limits, I thought I reached my ultimate goal, until I saw that beautiful mountain for the first time with my own eyes, and I was in love. My mom always says, uh, you know, this one, I wish one day you would look at the man the same way you look at the mountain. <laughs> she looks so happy. She always says that when we have aunts over. She's like, you look at it like it's your love. I'm like, yeah, but I love mountains. <laughs> so I saw that beautiful mountain and I was infatuated. I remember prior, prior, prior to seeing it, I had done one mountain. I had done one, one Kilimanjaro. And I saw it and I said, you know what? I'm going to climb Everest in a year. I gave myself a year. So in one year, I'm going to come back and I'm going to climb that mountain. It's a bit arrogant. I don't know what I was thinking, but came back and in the span of a year, I did eight mountains, a lot of emails back and forth between my dad and Because every time I came back, they were like, it's the last one. Yes, it's finished. Please, please finish. Two weeks later, I'm like, you know that here's a mountain, I thought of climbing. So a year and eight months, a, a, a year and eight mountains later, I was on the Hillary Step, and I was taking the, the, the Hillary Step, for those of you who don't know, is it's a pathway that everyone needs to pass if you're, if you're, high, if you're climbing Everest from the east side. It's named after Edmund Hillary, which is the first man that climbed, the man that climbed Everest. So me, a Saudi girl from Jeddah, was standing in this little walkway, about to reach the highest mountain in the world. And I can't explain to you how that meant to me. It didn't matter that I was a woman or Saudi or brown. Or, it didn't matter. I was doing what I loved. And I was living it. I had men from all shoulder to shoulder. My, my teammates were all with me. And it didn't matter. Because I was doing what I loved. I was doing what people told me I could never do. And honestly, I, I often worry that climbing this mountain would be a selfish act more than a selfish one. Climbing is a selfish sport. It's very difficult, it's dangerous, it takes a lot of time. But all my worries melted away the day a little girl came up to me and said, she decided to ask her father to ride a bicycle because she heard my story. And for those of you who don't know, riding a bicycle was outlawed for women up to 2013. I had to learn how to ride a bicycle two years ago because we were never allowed to ride bicycles. So this little girl came up to me and said, well, actually, it was, it was uh, we were communicating online. And she said she decided to climb a mountain, and that's, that to me is, is an honor. And uh, 
if in the end of the day you walk out and completely forget about this crazy side woman who's climbing mountains, I want you to remember that at some point in time, me, who's standing here, who grew up here in the desert, from Jeddah, I used to go to the world. A Saudi woman touched the sky. What are you capable of doing? If I can do it, then your dreams are not far from age. Thank you. <laughs> have some time for Q&A, and uh, just to get started, uh, think about your questions, but just to get started, so you mentioned uh, the importance of your family and their, uh, the way that they raised you to be able to, to you know, conquer your fears and do whatever you want, uh, but not everyone has the luxury of having a yeah. family like that, so what would be sort of your you know, advice to people who don't necessarily have that confidence, have that backing? Um, I think the majority of, of especially in the region of, of people, and especially women, are afraid of failure. They're afraid of failing, so they're afraid of hearing the word no. If you're hearing the word yes too much, you're not doing something that's, that's worth it. You're not doing something that's moving you. So don't be afraid to hear no. Don't be afraid to be put down. Take it as an invitation. They say no, you tell them, you know what? I don't agree. Always have that open openness with your family and especially in the Arab world it's really hard sometimes to sit them down and say I know this is what you want me to do I know this is what you believe is the right thing to do but here's my point of view it's very hard for us to do that so always have an open conversation and never be afraid of failing yeah. and is that was that the mentality that you took into going oh no I'm sorry we're no. going to Denali, oh, Denali. so Long story short, that mountain really nearly killed me, and not just physically, emotionally, uh, mentally. I took, it took me a year to be able to put my gear back on, my, my jacket and my boots. I would get, uh, I had similar to PTSD, like I couldn't put my gear on. And I, I had to work really hard to get over the, the, the fear of the mountain. But then I realized my fear of, my fear of giving up is bigger than the mountain. So I, I, I killed myself training for the last year, I didn't end up finding a sponsor, which was a big letdown. I thought I can find a sponsor at least for the fine. I mean, I don't really care about records, but you'd think they would get a little bit of backing. I didn't even get that. But in the end, my father was the one that said, you need to get basically suck it up and go back to the Nali. He, him, who was, he was, oh, he was the one that pushed me in the end, and he was the one that sponsored the last climb because he, he, he knew that I'll probably wake up few years down the line and think I regret doing that because it was my last one, and I hate giving up. So yeah, I can't believe I did it actually. So considering that was your supposed last one, what's what's next for you? Lots of beach time <laughs> for the next like three weeks. Um, I, I always have been and I always will be the person that strives to be happy. So whether it's climbing or hiking or, or hopefully down the line, I really want to help people. I was, I was explaining it earlier. I want to represent a, a, a cause or to champion a cause hopefully. And uh, yeah, just to, to live happy. And I have, a, I have a big thing on my bucket list, which is, it's, a, it's actually a book, but it's, it's a hidden, a big thank you message to my parents for not killing me years ago. So it's a, it's my memoir, but it's honestly it's commemorating my mom and my dad for for being honestly such amazing parents. Even though they stood in my way, they've 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 really they've really changed what it means to be a Saudi parent in the state because we didn't lose each other, we, and it was hard for them socially. They kept getting a lot of negativity every time. Every time I'd go to a wedding, and you see it. So Saudi weddings are segregated. I'm I'm not very I'm a bit taller than S Saudi girls. So I walk in like like a zua like a nechla, you know. I walk in with my mom, and then you'd hear them. Oh, who's this mean hag bint me? I'm here. I'm, I'm not deaf. I'm athletic. It's, you know, it's not. You know. So there's stigma, and my parents had to endure this. I can endure it because I don't care what anyone thinks, but they had to do it. So. It's a big thank you to them. So that's a lot of the part of the work that you're doing right now, right? To, to change, to change, to change yeah, the to mentalities. Change if I exist, then you can't tell me other girls like me and better don't exist. Yeah, so hopefully. So how much of it is actually physical and uh, how much of it is like mind game? I love this question. I've climbed with triathletes, I've climbed with 
uh, overweight people a little bit. I've climbed with smokers. I've climbed with psychopaths. I've climbed with <laughs> with narcissists. I've climbed with beautiful people. I've, I've climbed with so many different people. It doesn't matter if you don't have the right mind. Your body doesn't matter. Your body is enough to get to, to get to the mountain. Your body is enough to arrive. But what keeps you going and what keeps you alive is your mind. I was I once saw a guy triple my height, cry like a little baby because he had the blister. <laughs> it's difficult, but blister, patch it up, suck it up, and go. But because he's been climbing for three, four weeks, and a majority of men have higher muscle mass than women. So what happens when you're climbing with less oxygen for a month to your body? If you are mostly muscle, you deflate. Muscle survives on oxygen. So these macho, I call them the roosters. These machos that show up with the glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and no, Anna, no. There's a, there's a lovely word in Lebanese. Jagal? <laughs> hey, you know? Thank you. They show up. Yeah, this is... This <laughs> These guys show up, you know, and then a month down the line, so <laughs> mentally they break, and I've seen them. They're not as fast as they were. They don't sleep well, and it, and they they their mind just goes. Whew. So if you don't have a strong mind, and I've seen, I've, I've climbed with a guy who had one leg, wow. and he was a he, this guy was an ex uh, uh, military. He had one leg. He carried the same weight we all carry. And I did not hear him complain once. He would arrive camp. I know I'm, I'm sidestepping, but I, I, I saw this with my own eyes. He would arrive camp because they would duct tape his prosthetic leg so that it stays. He would arrive camp, they'd cut the, the duct tape, they'd take off the prosthetic leg, and then he'd shove the, the stuff into the snow. And if you see, it'll. Because it's so hot, he never complained. And on high side, there was a guy complaining about. Yes, so, mind, body gets you there, body gets you moving, it keeps you alive and survives your body. I mean, I'm not a very big person, but I'm going to give this number. Did you have to try how much uh, physical training So for Denali, because I was so nervous about Denali, I trained for two months, in two months straight, I had eight days off in two months. And what was that training look like? It's every, it, it's cardio, it's, it's cardio endurance. Uh, strength and conditioning and stamina. So training would be two hours, two hours, two hours a day, or four hours, one shot, or actually two twice. I did six hours. So I was in the gym for six hours. Thank God for Netflix because I was going to shoot myself. So I had my my iPad and I was carrying twenty five kilos. And you, it's called conditioning. And we don't have mountains, so unless but Anya, I have to deal with it. <laughs> Who was that lady who told you she would climb uh, Kilimanjaro and she's, inspired you? She's, she's, she's never been, she wasn't a very close friend of mine. She was just... But she was Saudi? No, oh. she was Palestinian, Iraqi. She's never, she wasn't even my group. She wasn't even someone that was close to me. She was just someone who was in the right place at the right time. And in which context did you meet her? It wasn't in Saudi. No, you know, and, you know in Ramadan tents, oh. a lot of people pass by and they chill. So, my first question is, you have to oh, do sit-ups. Like, <laughs> you have another challenge you're eyeing? I just finished it. Now I'm eyeing the beach. <laughs> That's me. Yeah. And the second question, I think you are the, the brand ambassador, right? For, yes. Yeah. So do you feel people recognize you now more? Or they know who you are? Like, how was your experience after you got some media coverage? Like, people seeing you. Good and question. Like, are you the lady from that ad? And like, did you really find that friend? So I was really, really, really nervous when Lipton approached. Lipton is huge in Saudi, and I, I was just like, I'm not sure, but I really did this to climb them up. I wasn't really sure, but I give them so much credit for, for having the guts to, to back me. They've never done that. They've never had a female, a female period to back the brand. And as soon as it launched, I was like, you know, I had my, my hand in my heart. But as soon as my dad called and said, This is amazing! I want to send it to everybody! <laughs> I was like, It got the approval from the Saudi people. Because I worked really hard to make it authentic. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's here. And I didn't show anything. It was for the. Is that, sorry. And it was, uh, we shot in Austria in December. 
Okay, cool. <laughs> Actually, stop cool. Yeah. So it's this, and uh, I've noticed so many girls come up to me and say, "Yeah, but I'm it's, it's really cute." Uh, and and I'm always for two seconds when people say, "Are you the girl?" I'm always like, you know, I don't know what they're gonna say. But let's say half half, I get, "Oh, this is great," or "This is stupid." And um, one of my favorite stories is I had an event in Riyadh. 24 hours, I have my bag, did the event, I'm flying back, I forgot my lucky Swiss army knife in the bag. And this knife has been with me all the, con all the continents and all the climbs. And the guy was refusing to let me go on the plane with it. And they were about to close check-in, and I don't have a check-in bag. And I made it such a big hoop level, it's, it's this big. And if, if you want to laugh, I'll show you the video because I was taking a video. It's this big and I was like, I'm not going on the plane, I want it, I must check in. So they called the biggest guy, the policeman, because I made a big deal. I'm like, I'm not throwing it, get me out, I'll, I'll wait another flight, but I'm not throwing this. So this head guy with, I don't know, 20,000 stripes came up to me. He's like, in Arabic, he's like, what's the problem? Why does this mean so much to you? I, I helped them, like, this thing saved my life. I had it with me in seven continents. And I climbed the highest mountains in the world with it. I'm not letting it go. He very proudly looked at me. He said, "We only have one mountain climber, and you're not her." I'm like, "Really? What's your name?" He said, "Rahab Harik." I'm like, "Really? Open the passport in your hand." He had my passport. <laughs> <laughs> Open it. He opened it. He's like, "Oh, you're taller than I thought." <laughs> he goes, "Oh, another pass. Let's go." And he was like, he made me like princessa. So I do get, I do get negativity, but the positivity washes it away. Okay. It's just. I'm very, very lucky. Um, after the beach, because you seem pretty adamant on getting more women to not just, you know, discuss, not just do these things and have the bravery to do these things, but also give themselves a chance to discover. <laughs> I'm not trying to draw attention to this. Not yet. You're taking away my thunder. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you're asking me. <laughs> Because a big part of it is not just women who want to do different things, it's women giving themselves the opportunity to know that they want to do different things. You seem pretty adamant on making sure you know that happens. And so I, I try my best to associate myself with international uh, movements that are trying to help women in the region. For example, uh, I spoke on behalf of Human Rights Watch a few times in New York, in Women in the World, and in Frankfurt for their gala. So by associating myself with these people who advocate, then I have a, I have a point. I'm not just standing there on stage and talking to you know, them. As, as fun as this is, my message is we need sports because it's a health problem. We have vitamin D deficiency. We have brittle bone problem. We have a lot of problems in the new, most of the generation because they don't do any sports. So I try as much as I can to lead by example and also to highlight this issue. To try to go to schools, but like I said, they don't really invite me much. You mean outside of Saudi? Outside of Saudi, I think, I think they're confused by me. <laughs> I think they don't know where to put me. Like I'm not a, no offense to anybody, but I'm not like a fashionista and I'm not a contour contour. Everybody's in love with it. I mean everyone likes a little bit of contour, but see, I mean, it's not really my thing. Everyone likes to look good, especially with the light in my nose. I, yeah, but um, it's not. Yeah, I admit it. But um, they don't know where to place me. I try to find an agent many, many times, and they don't know what to do with me. So from my end, I'm trying as much as I can to associate myself with the right uh, advocacies. Like I mentioned, it's really difficult. Sometimes I wish I was comfortable to the easier. <laughs> No offense, you guys look great. Back to the mountain. Um, I, I'm surprised that, yeah, no many. So when you were on the mountain, did you have any of your own, say, rituals or superstitions or things you never do for yourself to keep your mind in check during obviously some very difficult times? Yeah, I did actually. I had, uh, I had a few rules I followed. I, I. I was a bit embarrassed to say, I ate like an ogre, I peed like a racehorse, and I slept like a queen. Like a, you, <laughs> you, you, it's essential. It's essential. I'm not big, but 
are they, they, they like uh, you have to feed yourself because a lot of people go and they don't you, you know anything that they put in my plate and I'm a picky eater I would eat you have to and then you have to force yourself to go to relieve to go to the bathroom properly I know it sounds funny but there's no such thing as toilet you have to do a toilet break and trust me it's uncomfortable when you have a harness on and boots and everything to go to the bathroom. So you have to learn how to manage your body. And sleep is such an important aspect because you can be the fittest person and not be able to, to calm your mind to sleep on the mountain and you're useless. And you're useless to the team. And when you're useless to the team, you, you're not gonna continue. The other thing is, I, I, I had a very interesting relationship with fear. A lot of people say, well, you're not afraid. I'm always afraid. Accept the fact that you're going to be afraid. Don't say, oh, no, I'm not afraid because that's when arrogance comes up and that's when mistakes happen. I'm always afraid, but I managed what I was afraid about. I tried as much as I can not to chase the rabbit down the rabbit hole. These terms are all mine because I can't explain them. When you're climbing for so long and you're disconnected with your family, things start coming in your head. It's my family okay? Is my knee, my knee is hurting me. There's a sound in my shoulder and you start feeding yourself these doubts and these fears, so you really had to, to manage them. One of my favorite sayings, and I, I'm going to watch it because I don't remember who said it, um, they say that if you, have, uh, if you have two wolves, one is fear and one is bravery, which one will be stronger? And the answer is the one you feed more. So as much as you can, try to feed the positive side of your brain. Stuff comes up. I remember sometimes I was freaking out that my someone was sick or I, I was getting injuries, but you really have to man have a healthy relationship with fear and manage it, not deny it completely. I think it was a hand. After, uh, after the beach, after relaxing, do you see yourself embarking on another physical challenge? Do you see the next set of mountain ranges? So if my parents are watching, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think I will always have an adventurous spirit. Uh, I love it. It's part of who I am. I mean, it doesn't have. It doesn't necessarily have to be high altitude mountains that want to kill me. But the world is so vast and beautiful. I have such a long list of things to do. So I think I'm going to continue to do these things. And hopefully, not give my parents heart attacks, but just uh, a, a, a smaller level. I, I, I really. There's so many uh, ranges I want to do. I want to go back to Antarctica because I love that. The, the whole scene there, but um, I don't think I can stop. But I finished the big ones I wanted, so now I can <laughs> I can relax. <laughs> I think there was one more. I don't want to leave anyone. Just one very quick one. If you don't, if you have time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you can argue that. And you also have a question. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you can argue that uh, maybe one or two of these are really, really, really long, difficult hikes as opposed to flies. Which one would you say was the most difficult technique? Technically, yeah. Denali. D Denali, uh, it, there is two types of mountains. There's an assist, assisted mountain and a non-assisted mountain. An assisted mountain is like Kilimanjaro and Everest. Kilimanjaro being a smaller version because people help you port your stuff and there are stations and you don't have to carry everything. They are assisted, they're a non-expedition. An expedition style, which is Vincent and Antarctica and Denali, you are walking everything. Kitchen, house, everything, bathroom. So you need to carry your entire gear and entire food for three weeks or four weeks or whatever. So you start off with 25 kilo backpack and attached to it is a 25 kilo sled and eight kilo worth, worth of rope and emergency gear. And I was 60 kilos at the time. And you're not, you're not walking in the Kurunesh. You're not walking in City Wall. <laughs> <laughs> you, are, you are on inclined with, I'm so happy I'm wearing closed shoes today, by the way because they are purple and not the cute purple people paint on. So you, you get, you really, you really jam your body. I had bruises on my, my, my collarbone, I had bruises on my hips, and you need to every day be able to carry that. And I'm surprised no one asked about the bathroom situation. I'll tell you, because it's really interesting. I asked, that was one of the first things I asked. I was like, yeah, she asked about the bathroom. So all mountains are different. Some mountains have potty places, but the most interesting is Alaska. Because Alaska, they have something called a CMC can. But we can't end on this note. Someone has asked me a nice question like this. It's called a CMC can, it's green. And by law, you have to go number two in the can. You can't go anywhere else. You'll get a fine. Number one, there are what they call P1s. 
which is basically a yellow one for UPN. Okay. So number two, you don't get, you don't each get a bucket. You get, you get a bucket for a team or four buckets for a team. You need to carry the shit bucket. <laughs> and if it's your day to carry the shit bucket, you don't give shit. You put the bucket and you carry the bucket. Well, it's locked. It's not like oozing or whatever. Thank God. It's locked. And thank God, it's Alaska. So it's frozen. <laughs> but someone once asked me, a guy once told me and said, so what? And I was so angry in that event. You guys are lovely, but that event was was not a very positive vibe. And I look at him like, let me see how you feel carrying your shit bucket with your face. And then tell me this is easy. So you literally have to carry it because by law, you can't dispose of it because it's a national park. So an expedition, you have to carry everything. The stoves, the tents, it's a lot, it's a big load. So how do you get rid of the bucket? So you carry it. <laughs> <laughs> really? You really want to know? So, um, there are different, there are different air, um, if you are above, below a certain point, you lock it and you carry it down. Because you're already past the point. If you're above a certain point, they have very big crevasses that you can dump it in, and that's an allocated one, but it's only maybe one in every, I don't know how many meters. So technically you're carrying the, the poop bucket. So it's with you the whole week. It, it's with you, pretty much you have to carry it. Uh, it depends on the company. Some companies, they, the guides carry the bucket. Some, thank God, like the last time, the guides carry the bucket. But the one I did before, you carry the poop bucket and, and everybody was just like, you do what? And I told my mother and she nearly fainted. Like, really? But my mom said in Egypt, she's like, really? You're doing what? What? And she had this horror face, but it's a lot of, it's, it's extremely difficult to climb expedition style. And if, like I said, you're a team, and if you're not a good team, they'll, they'll cut you, they'll put you down, they'll let you go down. They will not allow you to continue. And the typical time for an expedition is? Oh, all the mountains are different. Some, uh, the smallest one was a few days. The longest one, which was Everest, was two months. Wow. Yeah. So it, it, my record of that showering, and it's again, sorry, mom, uh, was 22 days of not a single drop in my hair. <laughs> and if, you, if you're all curious, uh, I just posted all about my, I'm not going to show you the poop bucket, but on Instagram, uh, the last three weeks was my day-to-day -day of Denali. So if you're curious, have a look. It's so embarrassing, but it gives you a good insight about my, my climbing. We need a good question before they go. We can, I can't end on a poop bucket now. <laughs> <laughs> how many calories did you eat a day? Oh, I've been asked that many times. I, I, you know, I've never actually calculated, but I... I imagine like 3,000, 4,000? I once won the eating competition in Antarctica. It was me and 14 Marines and I won. Yeah, so you eat a lot. It, I don't know the exact number, but a question that's not related to pooing or pooing or your food. Yeah, you, the, 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 the climbing company is in charge of uh, managing your food. I'm milk intolerant, so we, for example, and I, I don't eat pork. So the, this company I had was amazing. So they had some people who are gluten intolerant, which is incredible, yeah. But I have an old place. I answer my stuff, by the way. If you have any random questions, I answer my stuff myself. Hence the bad spelling, but yes, I answer myself. I was always hearing that sometimes when people go for expeditions and somehow they fail, some of them leave other teams to go back to camp and so on. I heard that you, the first time you tried to climb uh, Denali, Denali you, you, couldn't, you, you couldn't do it. And why did you feel that your mind was stronger than your body or other way? And so how did you know you should stop, not like go, go further? What's the most dangerous thing on the mountain? What do, would you assume? Maybe the one with the stack. Give me answers. What do you know? Climbing mountain. Evidence. Your arrogance yes. is the number one killer on the mountain. I've seen so many, and quote me, <laughs> I've seen so many people die, yeah, like bodies, because of, of course, there are a lot of 
you know, things other than just things happen, someone breaks a lot. But I saw with my own eyes, that I, I, before I went to Everest, I was like, how can someone die, right? And I was like, how can this happen? And then when I was climbing Everest, I, and I was on the way down, because I was very fast on the way down, there were people coming up, crawling, crawling in ice. Why would you do that? Why on earth would you crawl to anywhere? And they were crawling, and most of them, if they don't get help, die. So in my case, uh, uh, Denali was a simple, the weather was bad, the team was weak, uh, it's a mountain, come back to Aladdin. It broke, it, it almost broke me, it took so much for me to, to accept that, but I lived to see another day, why would you do that? So the number one thing that kills people is arrogance, and, and lack of, uh, they just, I've seen it, I've seen people like, you know, Superman, and then you see them crying later, why? Halas, like, the mountain is dangerous, the mountain is perils, Anything can happen, and then add to that, you're, you're being arrogant. And that's why I get very annoyed when people say, conquered Everest. I didn't conquer anything. I was a little flea on the giant's back, and he was asleep. And I, ha I had a chance to go up and look in his eye and come back down. You don't conquer a mountain. You're just lucky to have a, have a shot. And there's a great uh, writer called um, John Krakauer. He wrote Into Thin Air, if anyone knows this book. Don't read it if you're on the mountain. I was going to say, did you read it before or after the mountain? On the mountain. <laughs> yeah, I read it on the mountain. It's about the tragedy that happened in 1997, about 40 people dying. And he says that we, you're not, we are human, so don't. So yeah, uh, what made me come back is I, I wanted to live. I, plus the weather was bad. We had many things to come back down, but I wouldn't even continue. I think that's a good question. Yes, a very good thing. Don't ask me about two again. <laughs> But I, I'm, I'm here for a bit, and I, like I said, I do answer my stuff. Don't make fun of my spelling, but yes, I do. And if you have any more questions, and it, it's honestly a pleasure. Thank you so much. So it much. took some time to yeah, get me, but... finally made it happen. I got it. So much. I'm sorry I talked fast, but I'm excited. No, this was really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.